Hello humans. So I've posted a few uh, bonus episodes in the last few months that are um, that are it's me reading things relating to dog training and animal behavior and the science of behavior, uh, reading aloud uh, short things that have uh, impacted the way I think about behavior. And I have read a couple of things in the last few weeks by Dr. Bob Bailey in anticipation of the screening and Q&A we are doing with Bob Bailey this weekend. You can still sign up at schoolforthedogs.com slash Bailey. It is taking place this Saturday, April 24th. At 4 p.m. Eastern, we will be showing this uh, rarely seen, really interesting short film by Bob Bailey called Patient Like the Chipmunks, and he will then be joining us after that for a conversation with me and a QA. and a uh, Bob Bailey uh, really is uh, a, a titan in the field of animal training. And uh, this film talks about his uh, rather extraordinary career, his business, uh, Animal Behavior Enterprises, which he started with his late wife, Marion Breland Bailey, and her late husband, Keller Breland, and uh, talks about sort of the history of operant conditioning from B.F. Skinner's lab through today. And it shows off some of the really entertaining and um, inspiring work that came out of animal behavior enterprises, including their IQ Zoo, which was basically an amusement park they created of trained animals. Um, It talks about some of their work with the military Anyway, just really fascinating stuff. So today I actually wanted to read a piece, um, an article that isn't by Bob Bailey, but he worked so closely with Marion Marion Breland Bailey, his uh, his late wife, and her husband, her first husband, uh, Keller Breland, and they are the authors of this article. Marion and Keller started Animal Behavior Enterprises, uh, and then Bob Bailey came on, and uh, Keller Breland died quite young, uh, 1965. He was only uh, 50 years old, and uh, Marion ended up later marrying Bob, which is why she uh, is known uh, as Marion Breland Bailey today, but when she authored this article with uh, her then husband Keller Breland in 1961 she was just Marion Breland so that's that's why she has uh, multiple last names the article is called the misbehavior of organisms Keller and Marion worked in BF Skinner's labs as graduate students when Skinner was at the University of Minnesota and uh, then basically took what they were learning, figuring out, codifying in these, uh, these laboratory environments and started working with literally hundreds of species of animals on a farm they bought in Arkansas in order to train animals uh, mostly for commercial purposes. They are often credited with being the first to use a clicker and really did work with with animals through their animal behavior enterprises that um, is unlike any other kind of um, reinforcement-based animal training I've ever seen. I don't think any any individual or company has taken things to the wild and wonderful extremes that they did, and some of this uh, is talked about in this uh, wonderful little film. This essay 
uh, is titled after B.F. Skinner's The Behavior of Organisms, a book he published in uh, 1938, which um, talks a lot about operant conditioning and how animals learn by consequence. And this essay is basically saying, hey, there, there is so much you can do to train animals using operant conditioning, but you still have to take into account the uh, instincts an animal is born with. This article has informed how I think about animal training in, in a huge way. However, I've always had one question uh, about the conclusions that this article raises, and um, I'm hoping that maybe this weekend, uh, after the screening, I'll have a chance to ask this question to Bob Bailey if it, if it is appropriate. I'll share my question with you uh, at the end of the reading, as uh, I think it'll make a little bit more sense if you hear it then. Two quick announcements. One, we have just opened up enrollment in our professional course, which is a fully virtual six-month program designed to train people to become dog trainers. There are only four spots. Applications are due May 1st, although we uh, are accepting applications on a rolling basis, so if the spots fill before then... uh, you may be out of luck. So make sure to get more information, fill out the application if you're interested at all at schoolforthedogs.com slash professional course. The second thing is I have been putting together an episode all about pet insurance and I am really curious to hear what you think about pet insurance if you have pet insurance or if you have had pet insurance if you fill out the short survey i created at schoolforthedogs.com slash pet insurance you will get a five dollar coupon to storeforthedogs.com i would really love to hear your thoughts my name is annie grossman and i'm a dog trainer I'm the owner and co-founder of School for the Dogs, a dog training center located in Manhattan's East Village. School, school for the dogs, for the dogs. School, school for the dogs, for the dogs. On this podcast, I talk about dog training, interview industry experts, discuss pet trends, answer questions, and try to communicate my love for all things related to behavioral science. Thanks a lot for listening. I think this podcast will help make you the best possible human best friend any dog could ask for. This is The Misbehavior of Organisms, published in American Psychologist in 1961, written by Keller Breland and Marion Breland of Animal Behavior Enterprises in Hot Springs, Arkansas. There seems to be a continuing realization by psychologists that perhaps the white rat cannot reveal everything there is to know about animal behavior. Among the voices raised on this topic, Beach, 1950, has emphasized the necessity of widening the range of species subjected to experimental techniques and conditions. However, psychologists as a whole do not seem to be heeding these admonitions, as Whalen, 1961, has pointed out. Perhaps this reluctance is due in part in some dark precognition of what they might find in such investigations. For the ethologist Lorenz, 1950, and Tinbergen, 1951, have warned that if psychologists are to understand and predict the behavior of organisms, it is essential that they become thoroughly familiar with the instinctive behavior patterns of each new species they essay to study. Of course, the Watsonian, or neo-behavioristically oriented experimenter, is apt to consider instinct an ugly word. He tends to class it with Hebb's, 1960, other seditious notions, 
which were discarded in the behavioristic revolution. And he may have some premonition that he will encounter this bete noir in extending the range of species and situations studied. We can assure him that his apprehensions are well grounded. In our attempt to extend a behavioristically oriented approach to the engineering control of animal behavior by operant conditioning techniques, we have found a running battle with the seditious notion of instinct. It might be of some interest to the, to the psychologist to know how the battle is going and to learn something about the nature of the adversary he is likely to meet if and when he tackles new species in new learning situations. Our first report, Breland and Breland 1951, in the American Psychologist concerning our experiences in controlling animal behavior was wholly affirmative and optimistic, saying, in essence, that the principles derived from, laboratory, from the laboratory could be applied to the extensive control of behavior under non-laboratory conditions throughout a considerable segment of the phylogenetic scale. When we began this work, it was our aim to see if the science would work beyond the laboratory, to determine if animal psychology could stand on its own feet as an engineering discipline. These aims have been realized. We have controlled a wide range of animal behavior and have made use of the great popular appeal of animals to make it an economically feasible project. Conditioned behavior has been exhibited at various municipal zoos and museums of natural history and has been used for department store displays, for fair and trade convention exhibits, for entertainment at tourist attractions, on television shows, and in the production of television commercials. 38 species, totaling over 6,000 individual animals, have been conditioned, and we have dared to tackle such unlikely subjects as reindeer, cockatoos, raccoons, porpoises, and whales. Emboldened by this consistent reinforcement, we have ventured further and further from the security of the Skinner box. However, in this cavalier extrapolation, we have run afoul of a persistent pattern of discomforting failures. These failures, although disconcertingly frequent and seemingly diverse, fall into a very interesting pattern. They all represent breakdowns of conditioned operant behavior. From a great number of such experiences, we have selected, more or less at random, the following examples. The first instance of our discomfiture might be entitled, What Makes Sammy Dance? In the exhibit in which this occurred, the casual observer sees a grown bantam chicken emerge from a retaining compartment when the door automatically opens. The chicken walks over about three feet, pulls a rubber loop on a small box, which starts a repeated auditory stimulus pattern, a four note tune. The chicken then steps up onto an 18 inch slightly raised disc, thereby closing a timer switch and scratches vigorously round and round over the disc for 15 seconds at the rate of about two scratches per second until the automatic feeder fires in the retaining compartment. The chicken goes into the compartment to eat, thereby automatically shutting the door. The, pop the popular interpretation of this behavior pattern is that the chicken has turned on the jukebox and dances. The development of this behavioral exhibit was wholly unplanned. In the attempt to create quite another type of demonstration which required a chicken simply to stand on a platform for 12 to 15 seconds, we found that over 50% developed a very strong and pronounced scratch pattern which tended to increase in pers persistence as the time interval was lengthened. Another 25% or so developed other behaviors, pecking at spots, etc. However, we were able to change our plan so as to make use of the scratch pattern, and the result was the dancing chicken exhibit described above. In this exhibit, the only real contingency for reinforcement is that the chicken must depress the platform for 15 seconds. In the course of a performing day, about three hours for each chicken, a chicken may turn out over 10,000 unnecessarily virtual identical responses. Operant behaviorists would probably have little hesitancy in labeling this as an example of Skinnerian superstition, Skinner 1948, or mediating behavior, and we list it first to whet their explanatory appetite. However, a second instance involving a raccoon does not fit so neatly into this paradigm. The response concerned the manipulation of money by the raccoon, who has hands rather similar to those of the primates. 
The contingency for reinforcement was picking up the coins and depositing them in a five-inch metal box. Raccoons condition readily, have good appetites, and this one was quite tame and an eager subject. We anticipated no trouble. Conditioning him to pick up the first coin was simple. We started out by reinforcing him for picking up a single coin. Then the metal container was introduced with the requirement that he drop the coin into the container. Here we ran into the first bit of difficulty. He seemed to have a great deal of trouble letting go of the coin. He would rub it up against the inside of the container, pull it back out, and clutch it firmly for several seconds. However, he would finally turn it loose and receive his food reinforcement. Then the final contingency. We put him on a ratio of two, requiring that he pick up both coins and put them in the container. Now the raccoon really had problems, and so did we. Not only could he not let go of the coins, but he spent seconds, even minutes, rubbing them together in a most miserly fashion and dipping them into the container. He carried on this behavior to such an extent that the practical application we had in mind a display featuring a raccoon putting money in a piggy bank, simply was not feasible. The rubbing behavior became worse and worse as time went on in spite of non-reinforcement. For the third instance, we return to the gallinaceous birds. The observer sees a hopper full of oval plastic capsules, which contain small toys, charms, and the like. When the SD, stimulus, uh, discriminative stimulus that stands for, a light, is presented to the chicken, she pulls a rubber loop which releases one of these capsules onto a slide about 16 inches long, inclined at about 30 degrees. The capsule rolls down the slide and comes to rest near the end. Here, one or two sharp, straight pecks by the chicken will knock it forward off the slide and out to the observer, and the chicken is then reinforced by an automatic feeder. This is all very well. Most chickens are able to master these contingencies in short order. The loop pulling the loop pulling presents no problems. She then has only to peck the capsule off the slide to get her reinforcement. However, a good 20% of all chickens tried on this set of contingencies failed to make the grade. After they pecked a few capsules off the slide, they begin to grab at the capsules and drag them backwards into the cage. Here, they pound them up and down on the floor of the cage. Of course, this results in no reinforcement for the chicken, and yet some chickens will pull in over half of the capsules presented to them. Almost always, this problem behavior does not appear until after the capsules begin to move down the slide. Conditioning is begun with the stationary capsules placed by the experiment experimenter. When the pecking behavior becomes strong enough so that the chicken is knocking them off the slide and getting reinforced consistently, the loop pulling is conditioned to the light. The capsules then come down the slide to the chicken. Here, most chickens who before did not have this tendency will start grabbing and shaking. The fourth incident also, come, also concerns a chicken. Here, the observer sees a chicken in a cage about four feet long, which is placed alongside a miniature baseball field. The reason for the cage is the interesting part. At one end of the cage is an automatic electric feed hopper. At the other is an opening through which the chicken can reach and pull a loop on a bat. If she pulls the loop hard enough, the bat, solenoid operated, will swing, knocking a small baseball up the playing field. If it gets past the miniature toy players on the field and hits the back fence, the chicken is automatically reinforced with food at the other end of the cage. If it does not go far enough or hits one of the players, she tries again. This results in behavior on an irregular ratio. When the feeder sounds, she then runs down the length of the cage and eats. Our problems began when we tried to remove the cage for photography. Chickens that had been well conditioned to this behavior became wildly excited when the ball started to move. They would jump up on the playing field, chase the ball all over the field, even knock it off on the floor and chase it around, pecking it in every direction, although they had never had access to the ball before. This behavior was so persistent and so disruptive, in spite of the fact that it was never reinforced, that we had to reinstate the cage. The last instance we shall relate in detail is one of the most annoying and baffling for a good behaviorist. Here, a pig was conditioned to pick up large wooden coins and deposit them in a large piggy bank. The coins were placed several feet from the bank, and the pig required to carry them to the bank and deposit them, usually four or five coins for one reinforcement. Of course, we started out with one coin near the bank. 
Pigs condition very rapidly. They have no trouble taking ratios. They have ravenous appetites naturally, and in many ways are among the most tractable animals we have worked with. However, this particular problem behavior developed in pig after pig, usually after a period of weeks or months, getting worse every day. At first, the pig would eagerly pick up one dollar, carry it to the bank, run back, get another, carry it rapidly and neatly, and so on, until the ratio was complete. Thereafter, over a period of weeks, the behavior would become slower and slower. He might run over eagerly for each dollar, but on the way back, instead of carrying the dollar and depositing it simply and cleanly, he would repeatedly drop it, root it, drop it again, root it along the way, pick it up, toss it up in the air, root it some more, and so on. We thought this behavior might simply be the dilly-dallying of an animal on a low drive. However, the behavior persisted and gained in strength in spite of a severely increased drive. He finally went through the ratio so slowly that he did not get enough to eat in the course of a day. Finally, it would take the pig about 10 minutes to transport four coins a distance of about six feet. This problem behavior developed repeatedly in successive pigs. There have also been other instances, hamsters that stopped working in a glass case after four or five reinforcements, porpoises and whales that swallow their manipulanda, manipul manipulanda, don't know that word, balls and, uh, balls and inner tubes, cats that will not leave the area of the feeder, rabbits that will not go to the feeder, the great difficulty in many species of conditioning vocalization with food reinforcement, problems in conditioning a kick in a cow, the failure to get appreciably increased effort out of ungulates with increased drive, and so on. These we shall not dwell on in detail, nor shall we discuss how they might be overcome. These egregious failures came as a rather considerable shock to us, for there was nothing in our background in behaviorism to prepare us for such gross inabilities to predict and control the behavior of animals with which we had been working for years. The examples listed we feel represent a clear and utter failure of conditioning theory. They are far from what one would normally expect on the basis of the theory alone. Furthermore, they are definite, observable. The, diagno the diagnosis of theory failure does not depend on subtle statistical interpretations or on semantic leisure domain. The animal simply does not do what he has been conditioned to do. It seems perfectly clear that with the possible exception of the dancing chicken, which could conceivably, as we have said, be explained in terms of Skinner's superstition paradigm, the other instances do not fit the behavioristic way of thinking. Here we have animals, after having been conditioned to a specific learned response, gradually drifting into behaviors that are entirely different from those which were conditioned. Moreover, it can easily be seen that these particular behaviors to which the animals drift are clear-cut examples of instinctive behaviors having to do with the natural food-getting behaviors of the particular species. The dancing chicken is exhibiting the gallinaceous bird's scratch pattern that in nature often precedes ingestion. The chicken that hammers capsules is obviously exhibiting instinctive behavior having to do with breaking open of seed pods or the killing of insects, grubs, etc. The raccoon is demonstrating so-called washing behavior. The rubbing and washing result, I'm sorry, the rubbing and washing response may result, for example, in the removal of the exoskeleton, exoskeleton of a crayfish. The pig is rooting or shaking behaviors which are strongly built into the species and are connected with the food-getting repertoire. These patterns to which the animals drift require great physical output and therefore are a violation of the so-called law of least effort. And most damaging of all, they stretch out the time required for reinforcement when nothing in the experimental setup requires them to do so. They have only to do the little tidbit of behavior to which they were conditioned. For example, pick up the coin and put it in the container to get reinforced immediately. Instead, they drag the process out for a matter of minutes when there is nothing in the contingency which forces them to do this. Furthermore, increasing the drive merely intensifies this effect. It seems obvious that these animals are trapped by strong instinctive behaviors, and clearly we have here a demonstration of the 
prepotency of such behavior patterns over those which have been conditioned. We have termed this phenomena, phenomenon instinctive drift. The general principle seems to be that wherever an animal has strong instinctive behaviors in the area of the condition response, after continued running, the organism will drift around the instinctive behavior to the detriment of the conditioned behavior and even to the delay or preclusion of the reinforcement. In a very boiled down, simplified form, it might be stated as learned behavior drifts toward instinctive behavior. All this, of course, is not to disparage the use of conditioning techniques, but is intended as a demonstration that there are definite weaknesses in the philosophy underlying these techniques. The pointing out of such weaknesses should make possible a worthwhile revision in behavior theory. The notion of instinct has now become one of the basic concepts in an effort to make sense of the welter of observations which, which confront us. When behaviorism tossed out instinct, it is our feeling that some of its power of prediction and control were lost with it. From the foregoing examples, it appears that although it was easy to banish the instinctivists from the science during the behavioristic revolution, it was not possible to banish instinct so easily. And if, as Hebb suggests, it is advisable to reconsider those things that behaviorism explicitly threw out, perhaps it might likewise be advisable to examine what, what they tacitly brought in, the hidden assumptions which led most disastrously to these breakdowns in the theory. Three of the most important of these tacit assumptions seem to us to be that the animal comes to the laboratory as a virtual tabula rasa, that species differences are insignificant, and that all responses are about equally conditionable to all stimuli. It is obvious, we feel, from the foregoing account that these assumptions are no longer tenable. After 14 years of continuous conditioning and observation of thousands of animals, it is our reluctant conclusion that the behavior of any species cannot be adequately understood predicted or controlled without knowledge of its instinctive patterns, evolutionary history, and ecological niche. In spite of our early successes with the application of behavioristically oriented conditioning theory, we readily admit now that ethological facts and attitudes in recent years have done more to advance our practical control of animal behavior than recent reports from American quote, learning labs, end quote. Moreover, as we have recently discovered, if one begins with evolution and instinct as the basic format for the science, a very illuminating viewpoint can be developed which leads naturally to a drastically revised and simplified conceptual framework of startling explanatory power to be reported elsewhere. It is hoped that this playback on the theory will be behavioral technology's partial repayment to the academic science whose impeccable empiricism we may have used so extensively. So here is, is what I would like to know about this essay, and I'm hoping maybe uh, I can ask this question to Bob Bailey. Actually, maybe it's, maybe it's kind of two questions. Anyway, the first time... I read this essay, my takeaway from it was that classical conditioning is so strong or so, so powerful that animals uh, create associations or can create associations with uh, objects that lead them to treat the object as if it were the thing with which they are associating it with, as if it is the primary reinforcer. So the pig has enough experience getting food for putting his coin in the piggy bank that eventually he starts engaging in uh, instinctual behaviors built in behaviors that relate to the way in which he would be treating uh, actual food. But in rereading the essay, I realize 
that maybe is a, a, a conclusion that I'm that I'm making that isn't actually in the text, or maybe I'm just extrapolating, and, and I'm not sure if that is correct. Because classical conditioning is actually never mentioned in the essay. So maybe I'm just making assumptions. And if that assumption is correct, then what would happen if instead of using food as a primary reinforcer, you used something else, like sex, for example. That might sound silly, but there is animal training that is done where the reward for the behavior is access to an opposite sex member of the same species. I've specifically heard of this done with dolphins, where the reward is letting them into a pen letting the boy dolphins into the pen with the girl dolphins. If sex were the primary reinforcer instead of food, would the animals that uh, the Brelins are writing about have engaged in sexual instinctive behaviors with the objects in question? Or is it just a matter of of them being engaged with these objects uh, in a given environment for repeatedly for a specific amount of time that has resulted in them treating the objects like food? Does it have to do with the fact that they're working with objects that are maybe the size and shape of food they might encounter? Not sure how I can... um, (laughs) succinctly put all that into one question because now that I've said it all out loud it feels like there's a lot of stuff there but that's basically my question I guess I have a few days to figure out how to say it more clearly but are they treating these uh, secondary reinforcers these these conditioned reinforcers like food because of all the associations they've made with these objects Uh, having to do with food, if a different reinforcer, primary reinforcer was used, would their engagement with the objects relate to that different primary reinforcer? And does training have anything to do with it? Or is it just the fact that they're engaging with these objects at all? The latter question is something I've thought about more recently watching my daughter, who seems to me to have a strong, caring instincts. Jock Pan Skeep, whose name I'm probably saying wrong. (laughs) Um, But Dr. Jock Pan Skeep talks in his work about the emotional brain and uh, the things that that drive behavior being uh, seven things, seeking fear, rage, lust, care, panic, slash grief, and play. And she can make like a tiny baby to care for out of pretty much anything. Like if I think if I took a Sharpie and put two uh, eyes on a roll of toilet paper, she'd pretty much want to tuck it into bed and uh, read it a, a, a good night story. Now, I've never tried to train her to do anything specific with a uh, <laughs> roll of toilet paper that has eyes on it, but I could see that were I to try to do that, uh, I could imagine that the instinct to take care of it like a, uh, a baby might overpower whatever it is I was trying to get her to, to do with it. But the instinct is there even if I am not encouraging her to engage with that object in any specific way. And I wonder the same thing about the pigs. If the pigs were just in an environment with those coins, would they start spontaneously treating those coins like food because they were present. Now, before I I reread this essay recently and I I had stuck in my head that it was about uh, what I'm now not so sure of, but that it was about um, animals treating uh, objects that they've been conditioned to be interested in as if those objects were the primary reinforcer. 
I, I thought about that a lot as it relates to people and money. I started to think about how people are so deeply conditioned to associate primary reinforcers, the, the stuff we really need in life with money, that it seems like they sometimes treat money as if it were the primary reinforcer, at least in terms of the way people hoard it, guard it, stockpile it. I mean, people don't usually eat money or uh, want to have sex with money, but but I don't know. The way like people sometimes show off what their money can buy in ways that are uh, conspicuous. Maybe it has to do with an instinct we have to show off our resources, like the peacock showing off his feathers to show his uh, virility, good health, etc. We show off fancy cars or uh, conspicuously expensive jewelry as a way to flaunt the fact that we have extra resources because of conditioned associations that are so strong and the fact that it's easier than um, showing how full your refrigerator is. It's these uh, conditioned reinforcers being easier to, to show than um, the primary reinforcers. Anyway, I, <laughs> I hope uh, this article has sparked um, interested, if perhaps complicated, thoughts about behavior in your mind as well. And I hope you'll join me for this screening and uh, conversation with Bob Bailey tomorrow. Sign up at schoolforthedogs.com slash Bailey. Thanks so much for listening. You can support School for the Dogs podcast by subscribing, leaving a five-star review, telling your friends, and shopping in our online store. Learn more about School for the Dogs and sign up for lots of free training resources on our website, schoolforthedogs.com.